portions here and uh, all the here. And something, lastly, this concept of power kind of permeates throughout the hypothesis, hypothesis testing, and I'll do an example of uh, power there, basically the example from, from your lab, lab eight. So, any questions about what to expect on the exam? Yeah. If you haven't, can you post this? Yeah, I'm going to post this. Yeah. Sorry. I'm, I'm going to post this after class. All right. All right. And also, you know, post solutions to everything up to and including today's homework. So, uh, that will all be available for study. Okay, so let me just kind of summarize conjugate pairs real quick. And I thought this table would help kind of organize the thoughts on, on conjugate pairs. Basically, the idea is that if you can, if you, you're given a problem with you know what form you gave it. So you have two, two different kind of options here, two different conjugate pairs that we talked about. Either your data can take the form of binomial, so you have counts and successes or something. Or it can take the form of a Poisson. It's got something occurring over time or space. Also in your problem statement, you would have to be able to assume some prior. So if you can write your prior in terms of the beta distribution, if your data is binomial, then you've got this pairing going on. And if you can make, if you can set it up so that your data comes from the binomial, your prior, basically your distribution of your proportion here follows the beta. Then you know that your posterior is this beta distribution with alpha star and beta star calculated according to these two equations here. What's, what's going on with these two equations? Basically, what's, what's x here? Number of successes? Yeah, so this is your data, your number of successes that you collected in an experiment. And you're updating, right? So you've got some prior likelihood collect your data, and you update to get this posterior distribution. So these are your updated parameters that go into the data. <coughs> so that's all this table is saying. Is basically, this is your kind of recipe for getting the posterior. Because first you need to write your problem into this form, and you automatically know that your posterior takes this. And we, we basically focused on the beta binomial and the Poisson gamma. Um, but there's, I mean, there's other conjugate pairs, but you won't be tested on those. So, any questions about those? Yeah? Uh, what's sigma yi? So this is your, your sum of y's here. The sum of your data. Right? So you're just adding up your <coughs> counts or whatever. Yeah? Could we get an example of how something would be phrased? So like, yeah, so how to recognize Just an example. So, well, this is more relevant to last fall, but um, during the election, so it was Obama, Obama versus Romney. Um, and let's just say that we're dealing with a proportion here, P. And let's just arbitrarily define that proportion as the number of North Carolina voters who uh, are voting for Obama. I'm not, I don't want to be biased here. You could easily re reframe this problem in, term, in terms of P being the North Carolina voters who voted for Romney. I'm not taking sides here, but uh, let's just say it's set up this way. And let's also say that P follows a standard uniform distribution. So, we cannot, well, this, this is actual real poll data. So, a poll was conducted on October 8th. I forget what website I downloaded it from, but probably Google it to find out. So the sur survey to total, total number of people of 1,325, um, 546 of them said that they were likely to vote for Obama, the rest Romney, uh, and that percentage is 41.2% for Obama. So this is our, our P hat, basically. So what, what, what distribution is our data following? Binomial, right? So if we say x is equal to the number of votes for Obama, um, so x is following this binomial, right? With some p and some n, right? This is 
the standard uniform. So it's uniform from 0 to 1. Except on that last table, what was our first conjugate pair was binomial beta, right? Anybody know how we can rewrite this uniform in terms of beta? We would like to have this in, in as a beta distribution because then we automatically know what the, the posterior is, right? Beta 1, 1, yeah. So this is this is equivalent to well, We can also write this as P is beta 1, 1. And this is preferable because now we know how to write our posterior. So why don't everybody take a crack at writing out our posterior? Should, shouldn't take more than a couple minutes and you know working through some stuff. Basically using the, I'll go back to this last slide. Right? You just yes. assume. Um, how do we get that back to binomial distribution? I only know what P is. So if, so if we say that X is, if we define X as the number of upvotes for a right here, that's really P. Or basically, every time we call a person, that's another. It's assuming the least, right? So then we're summing those up, and that's it. Okay. So, it's, so our proportion. Yeah, the beta one one is uniform. Some of that is over n. Right. Right. So that's, I know. And then it's got p and then it's got beta one one. Right. Yeah. So it's equal to beta one one. So then we know that x follows this binomial distribution. We just need to plug in some numbers here. So we have 546, don't call them successes, but votes for Obama. Um, and we we phoned 1,325 people, right? So now we just need to plug in numbers here. This is your, your likelihood. So really the, the problem was finding this. And so if you go back here, well, we're just saying our original alpha was 1, we had whatever 546 successes, so it's 1 plus 546 there. So our new alpha star, our new beta parameter here is 547, and our new uh, beta is 750. <coughs> Yeah. How much of that work do we have to show? 
Um, well, I mean, you could just show beta 547 780 if it's right, you get all the credit. But if you want partial credit, show at least, you know, show all this stuff. I mean, the more work you show, the easier it is for us to assign partial credit. So kind of a scale there. <laughs> I would at least show this last line and show how you updated these parameters. Will we get a cheat sheet for the exam? Or can we make one? But yeah, just like the last exam, cheat sheet, bring a cheat sheet, bring a calculator. Same, same rules as last exam. Is yes. the formula sheet going to be the same as the first exam? Yeah, it's going to be the same formula sheet. We'll, in addition to the Z table that we gave you on the last exam, last exam <coughs> we'll give you a T table and uh, an F table if necessary. So we'll give you all necessary tables. Basically just copy of what you have in the book. Can we, can we also bring our cheat sheet from the last exam? Uh, one cheat sheet, so. Okay. So you so no. scrunch that <coughs> stuff you had in the last exam down to okay. one side and just fill out the other side. <coughs> yeah. So beta 1, 1, so we're given that P here follows this standard uniform, right? And our, stand, our PDF for the standard uniform is, um, <coughs> is, so f of x for this is, well, it's just 1 from 0 up to 1, right? So we can, if we take the beta and give it the parameter values 1 and 1, that will also be equal one to this standard new one, that is 1 from x from 0 to 1. So it's, I mean, it's pretty easy to show that equivalency, like you can just plug it in. It's, but definitely, it's good to know a priori that beta 1, 1 is equal to the same. Like that's a common, this is a common prior beta 1, 1, because it's the same. And you can treat that by the first one? I'm sorry. Yeah, so this is just, we're taking the beta PDF here. You can look up this equation on you know, again, the, the sheet at the end, and if you plug in 1, 1, you'll get that the density is equal to 1. Or minus equal to 2. Yeah, question? Are there any other common ways that we ran into with one distribution of the distribution? Is there what? Is there a way for like writing a uniform distribution in Canada? Like, say you gave us like a sum, and like you gave us like two. Um, no, not, no, there isn't. So that's really just a trick with the beta. Okay. So, oh yeah, one last question. What is the posterior telling you? The updated probability? Yeah, so it's, so this is like your expert belief. So let's say you didn't really know anything about, you know any data, so you go and ask an expert, you know, what's the probability of a bomb running? We have, we have no data, we have no idea what's going on. And so the expert said, well, the probability of the winning that is P will, can, is uniformly distributed from zero to one, which is really naive. It's basically saying nothing. You know, it's not giving much information. So then you collect some data, and now you have this posterior distribution of P, which is much more informative. It's actually, uh, you can plot this beta. I don't know what it looks like, but basically, um, So before we had 0, 1, and 1. And this scale here is P, or probably move on with right? So this is before, which isn't really saying much. And then we update it with our data. We collect some data. We know it follows this binomial likelihood function. Now we have a new distribution of P. And I don't know what <coughs> this looks like, but maybe it um, you know, look something like like this. So it's giving you much more information. It's saying, well, the probability of Obama winning is probably greater than, you know, it's probably over here. You know. So it's, and it's incorporating both. In the exam, we would give you something that's much nicer than this to find the integral analytically. So you would actually be able to do that integral from that probability. This is kind of ugly, so. Uh, if you're outside of the exam, you'd be able to say use MATLAB and plug in this, or you could 
we call that interval a variety of ways. But basically, the probability comes down to uh, something pretty small. So I didn't I didn't draw this red. This isn't the, the true posterior that we have there. It probably looks reversed. So any questions about finding that probability there? Well, let's kind of rearrange this thing and say, well, what value does the proportion of, of Obama, uh, I'm sorry, of Obama voters have a 95% chance of exceeding? So how would we rewrite this line up here to find, <coughs> to, to evaluate this question. Yeah. So if I think I heard you correctly, basically you're saying set this interval equal to 0.95, right? That's the first thing you said, and then and then our, the value we have is the upper limit of this interval. So we put in some, some constant there that we're trying to find. So let's call that thing L. And well, since we're doing uh, 1 minus, well, we've got 0 0.05 instead of 0 0.95 there. And then this is just our beta PDF, our posterior PDF. So again, you can, if this was a simpler, this, this took a simpler form, uh, you could find this analytically and just solve this integral and then you have L in there. Or you can use in MATLAB this beta inverse plug in those values. But basically you're saying that um, there's a 95% chance of our true proportion exceeding And on the test, how would we, like, would we be given data inverse, or, I mean, the... Well, on the test, you would have, this would be a simpler form, and you could actually solve this one. So you'd have something, you'd have something nice to plug in here. Or we would give you, yeah, a value or something. You, you wouldn't, obviously, you can't evaluate beta I and B. You don't have that lab on the exam, so it, it would be nice. Yeah. Um, could you also just Yeah, yeah, so you could flip this around, so what we're, yeah, exactly, you could do uh, L to 1 and have 0.95. Yeah, yeah. we do let all of our answer as beta inverse of 0.05 times 480, or do we have to give, like, an actual value? So again, you'd have to give a value, right? So, yeah. So you'd be able to solve this and you'd make it something nicer than what is in this example. But I thought this example was nice because it uses real data and it's kind of interesting. Yeah. Um, uh, what does that value mean, like, intuitively? So let's actually draw what's going on here. So what we're saying is we've got this uh, posterior distribution that maybe looks, I don't know what it exactly looks like, but maybe it looks something like this, from 0 to 1. And we're trying to find L. We're trying to find some value L that's exceeded 95% of the time, right? So that'll have uh, basically 95% of this mass on the right-hand side. Like, so what does that mean, I guess, in terms of the voting? Mm -hmm. So what does that mean in terms of, it's, so, there's, I mean, basically what it means is there's a 95% chance of P being greater than 0.39, right? So, 
it's not really saying a whole lot because, you know, from 0.39 to 0.5 is Obama losing, right? <coughs> 0.5 and up is Obama winning, so it's, oh, okay. it's incorporating both of those, so it's talking those about outcomes that we're interested in. But um, basically we're trying to find, you know, how confident are we about some, okay. some uh, performance. Okay, so let's move on. Let's talk about uh, power here. So this is from Lab 8, and this was the actual credit question, and um, we don't post solutions for labs, but I thought it would be useful to go over another power example because um, this is kind of a little bit tricky. So in that question, we'll, we, we'll recall that that lab was about hypothesis testing, and it was using... Um, you know, the proportion of fixable medical devices in, in third, world, third world countries. So, find and compare the powers of the, the tests that we did. So we used the real data for one test and the fake data for another test. We actually set up those hypotheses and recall that your hypotheses should have been Well, what was our what was our null hypothesis for that for the test? What was our H not in that lab? So we're dealing with P, right? And that was what was our null value? 0.5. 0 0.5, right? Because we want to find. Um, Basically, our hypothesis test was show that these medical devices are fixable most of the time, right? So this was less than or equal to 0 0.5, or you could say P is uh, equal to 0 0.5. Either, either of those statements work. An alternative was that P was greater than 0 0.5, right? So those are our original tests. But well, let's see how powerful they are if our true P was greater than 0.5. So, um, so again, our, our beta is what kind of error? What kind of error does that, does beta correspond to? Type, type 2 error, right? So this is our probability of getting type 2 error, and type 2 error is um, not failing to reject a, a false hypothesis, right? So we can state 1 minus beta is 1 minus this probability. So that's just what it is in words. But now we need to write, translate these, these statements mathematically. So we can say not rejecting H naught is occurs when our test statistic falls below some Z value. And our tests were all at the uh, alpha equals 0.05 level. So we're looking for this z value of corresponding to 0.95. Right? And that comes out to be 1.65 or 1.645. And our test statistic for this proportion is just this formula. And we're given that our false p is this 0.55. So we're just carrying this into our conditional statement here. Then, um, I mean, there's a variety of ways to then kind of work with the algebra here. Here's just one way. So you could move this denominator to the 1.65 side. Really, the next trick comes in then shifting the, the mean of that test statistic. So incorporating this conditional statement in there. And so how do we... Do that well. We both add and subtract that 0.55 onto the the left-hand side of our our hypothesis testing. So we're doing that, and then um, let's see, and then basically. This is a little bit trickier than the mean example because our test statistic for the proportion 
includes the null value in both the numerator and denominator. And ultimately what we want is our, our probability written in terms of test statistics, the test statistics is just our, our false 0.55 value. So we have to then have a denominator that has 0.55 instead of 0.5 in it on both sides here. And, and then we're just, uh, what's that? So, and, oh right, then we're just moving the 0.55 minus 0.05 over to this side so that we're left with, on the left hand side, p hat minus 0.55, which is our new true value and with the denominator incorporating just that new true value. We're left with this probability statement that we'd then be able to evaluate if we knew n. So, so let's plug in some n values. So we're asked to find the power for those, both the original data and the fake <coughs> data. So n for the original data was something very large, it was like 2,529. So we plug that in there and just evaluate this using, say, the Z table or what, what have you, and you should end up with something very, very close to 1 as your power. If you do it with the fake data with N of 50, so a much smaller sample size, you end up with a much smaller power, <coughs> about 0.17. So then the conclusion is that, well, large samples are more powerful. And that's intuitive, right? If you sample more things, you should have a more robust test. Or in other words, your probability of type 2 error is much smaller when you have a larger sample size. Yeah, questions? How hard is it if you have So, basically what happened in this step, let me write out that step actually. So, what we wanted on just one side of this thing is a p hat minus 0.55 over the square root of 0 0.55 times 0 0.5, or 1 minus 0 0.55 times 5 by n. So that's the n value. So we want to do this. So this is what we want on one side. And then we move the rest of this term over to this other side. So the next term can continue to So then, yeah, this is our, this is our kind of standardized test statistic here, and so this becomes our So that the proportions is that if it's something of this form, <coughs> follows a pretty long one that covers kind of a lot of different things, um, and it's somewhat similar to the linear regression, simple linear regression maximum likelihood estimator that's an example in the slides from when I talked about MLEs. So basically if you're given a, a random sample of y's, so y's are our random variables here. And we know that the y's follow this this model here. So this isn't the simple linear uh, regression model anymore, but it's some other kind of exponential model here. So for each y1 through n, there's a corresponding x value that's constant, that's fixed. That's not an anchor. So first, firstly, we ask you to say write out the likelihood function, then use that likelihood function to find the MLE for beta. <coughs> and then some follow-up questions for, so this is kind of, these go together, and then some follow-up questions might be, say, find the bias of the MLE you found here, find the standard deviation or variance of that MLE, and then just write out a, uh, an equation for the confidence interval for that, for beta. So why don't you guys try to tackle these uh, in groups for maybe the next 10 minutes. Um, 
see how far you can get, at least try to get through this part. This is the trickiest part, I think. And recall basically the steps in doing this MLE. So first we, well, what's generally the, the likelihood of function, just generically? How do we find that thing? Yeah, multiply what? Yeah, so it's, you're multiplying your your PDFs together, right? So it's just the product of 1 through n different PDFs multiplied together. And once you have that likelihood function, how do you then find the MLE? So you may want to take the log. You don't always have to, but a lot of times it will help you out. And then ultimately you want to do what? Yeah, take the derivative of this likelihood function with respect to beta, right? With respect to whatever parameter you're trying to estimate. So why don't you guys try to tackle those in, in groups for, yeah, again, 10 minutes. And then we'll talk about how you step through that. We're walking around, I think most people got this. Um, so the first step would be to take the log of that original model. And then you know the distribution of the log of tau, so you want to isolate this and get this on one side. So we're just rearranging that original model in terms of log tau, which we know is normally distributed with these parameters, 0 and sigma squared. And then the other side of that model is, well, log of y minus beta x. So what can we say about the log of y minus beta x? It's also normally distributed, right, with these parameters? Yeah, exactly. So then all we're doing with setting up our likelihood function is taking this normal equation here, and generically we've got this x as our random variable, but our random variable, the problem is now this whole thing, ln y minus beta x. And there's one through n different instances of this, this new variable, right? So we're plugging that difference in for x, what's our mu? Our mu is zero, right? So this this part just we can ignore. And then we need to keep sigma squared in here because, well, this is some known constant, but we don't have a value to, to plug in for it yet. So our one through n different instances of this PDF simply comes from plugging in the one through n different instances of this new variable in for x in our normal equation. And then we take the products of those one through n different PDFs. How did I get to this last step here? Yeah. Well, when you multiply something with a similar base, the exponents add. So you're just... Okay. You, so you're just multiplying e to the whatever times yeah. e to the whatever, so you sum them. Right, yeah, exactly. So we're, we're getting rid of this product by looking at, well, this times, you know, n different instances of that. And so you can take this first factor and simply raise it to the exponent of, let's see, well, it's basically just raised to the exponent of n, but we also took out the minus 1 from it being this being in the denominator here, and also took out the one half of the square root. So this becomes a little more complicated than just n. And then if you're multiplying a bunch of different exponents together, well, the stuff in the exponent becomes a sum, right? So that's how we get this summation. Okay. So that's just a little algebra to get to here. And this is the reason why we get it into this form is that it's easier to then take the derivative of so taking the derivative of you know this product symbol thing. Sorry, what also you... is it what's Sorry. nicer? Or I guess what can we do to make this even nicer? Take the log of that. Yeah we just take the natural log of this. So this factor in the in the beginning becomes a new term. Uh, which has nothing but constants in it, so when we take the derivative, that'll actually cancel out. And then we basically, this exponent cancels out, we're just left with what's in the exponent as 
as our log likely was. Yeah. Sorry, how could we go from the, on the previous slide, how could we go from like y minus, lin of y minus beta x to the likelihood of beta given the different y's? Like from the term on the left to the likelihood, if that makes I'm sense. Not following you, how, do we, how are we getting from this to what? Uh, from the lin of y minus beta x to the likelihood. Yeah. Is, I mean, I don't know if that question makes sense. I so, guess. I see. So our, our PDF of, well, this is just our, going by the definition of the likelihood function, right? Okay. So this is our PDF of y given uh, okay. beta, right? Yeah. Basically. And I, so. Essentially, I'm asking how do we isolate beta? And I guess that's just the right, so by isolating beta is where the derivative is in, okay. right? So then, to get this isolating beta, to get its estimator, we take the derivative of, well, it's easier to work with the log, like we did here, with respect to beta. So if you take that log and then take the derivative with respect to beta, you end up with this, this equation here. So now we have, we've got the summation that was in the exponent, and the derivative will give us, we'll pull this x out here and get rid of the squares, this way. So we're left with that. And then it's just a matter of rewriting terms to isolate beta in this equation. So the sigma squared cancels out, and we're just moving terms around to get our beta hat is equal to, to that ratio of some set. Yeah, question? <coughs> Uh, so there should be parentheses. You can put parentheses around the xi squared. Yeah. Is, that, is that clear? So it's the sum of i different x squares. Yeah. Uh, can you divide out the xi? Can I? Can you um, like no. You Because you have xi squared here and just xi up here. No, what I mean is, can you have ln y over uh, some of x? No, because we you could rewrite that as let's just say we had i is equal to one and two. We would have ln y one times x one plus ln y2, x2, over x1 squared plus <coughs> x2 squared. Okay. So you can't really simplify that. Okay, so... So now we have this maximum likelihood estimator for beta. So that was our beta hat. Um, uh, well, one quick question. Uh, is that formula, is that for like the list of slides ago, um, when it's multiplied out, that means that you Is that going to be where? This, on this sheet. That, the sheet that we give you? Yeah. You know. Okay. So you, you may want to put, you know, some generic form of this on your cheat sheet if that would help. So then, what we're going to find the bias of this estimator. So, well, how do we do that? Well, we find, well, we can basically just tackle that by finding the expectation of that beta hat. Right? So, we just take, we plug in the functional form that we just found into this exponent, I mean, to this uh, expectation operator, I'm sorry. <coughs> Since we know that our x's are fixed constants for each y, move this expectation operator into the summation and just put it around the log of y. Since y is our only random variable here. And then what's our expectation for the log of y? So this is a little tricky here. I mean, obviously the answer is written right there, but how do we get that? So if we go back to our rearranged model, right, we had the 
the log of y minus beta x is equal to the log of tau. And both sides of these are distributed normally with 0 and the same squared, right? So what's the expectation of log of y minus beta x? It's 0, right? Because its mean is 0. But what's the expectation of just the log of y? It's positive beta x, right? Because we could say the log of y is distributed as this normal, some normal distribution shifted by beta x, right? So all we've done is we're basically just shifting the mean by beta x. And we can do that because both of these are constants. We, you can't do that if x is also a random curve. But we know it's a fixed value, so we can do that. So the expectation of log y is beta xi. And now we can draw the beta out of here and the xi squares cancel out. What's that? So you're not allowed to add the beta xi if it's a random variable? If xi, if this is a random variable, then you can't say this, right? Because it's not a constant value for each y. You've got some unknown value. So Isn't it just a random variable? Because if each y has a corresponding x i, it changes every line. So y is your random variable, and x is a fixed value. We can talk about that later. Kind of, I mean, it falls under some general principles of linear regression. We can talk about that after last week. But basically, we're given that these x i's are basically constants, and beta is a constant. So we're shifting over this distribution by some constant number. So if our expectation of beta hat is beta, then our bias is zero, right? Suppose we want to find the standard deviation of this MLE. Well, it proceeds much like it did for the expectation operator, except we now have this variance operator. So we're just taking the variance of this whole MLE that we just found. Again, since y is our only random variable, we move the variance to surround it. Except what happens with all these other terms now? That didn't happen with expectation. It's squared. We've got to square all these things now, right? Because recall the rule that uh, take the variance of some constant times y, the random variable y, well, that becomes a squared times r. So we're just treating all those x's as, those, as a here, squaring those. Then we need to act, ask, our, ask ourselves what the variance of log y is. And again, we go back to our rearranged log here. If we shift over this normal distribution by some constant, does that change the variance? No, our variance of this thing stays the same. So we just have sigma squared. And it's just a matter of crossing out some terms here. And then our standard deviation is just the square root of that. Questions? Yeah? Yeah, because for each, so if we re rewrite this thing, basically for each y, so y1 has uh, x1 divided by the sum of xi squareds, right? Plus x2. So basically the key is that each of these yi's are being multiplied by the xi and divided by the sum of xi squared. Each of these yi's aren't being multiplied by the sum of xi. So you have to pay attention to what your random variable is being multiplied by. Right. Any other questions about this? Okay. So last 
lastly, suppose that we wanted to set up a 90% confidence interval for beta. So we want an interval that will, given some estimator for beta, 